Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday Reads for six books. Bridget Brophy in Transit, a transsexual adventure. Dying by Rene Belletto, translated by Alexander Hertig. Danielle Memoir, public reading followed by discussion, translated from the French by K.E. Gormley. Eric Chevillard, The Author of Me, translated by Jordan Stump. Jenny Erpenbeck's new novel, Kairos, translated by Michael Hoffman, from the German. And finally, uh, Lee D. Thompson's A Pastoral, uh, A Mystopia. Pretty good reading week at all. I'm going to start with Bridget Brophy, who's an author I'd vaguely heard of but never read. And I think at the time, in the 60s and 70s, she was called uh, Britain's most smart woman. Uh, she wrote non-fiction, she wrote plays, and she wrote fiction. Um, this is very postmodern, very funny, very ahead of its time. I mean, Brophy was very sort of on the cutting edge of, of her political views. She was pro-animal rights, she was... Um, pro-gay rights, including uh, pro-transsexual rights, and this book sort of um, comes at that uh, from, a, from a, a very interesting angle. I'm not saying she was unique, but I think she was ahead of her time, certainly in the arts, in taking on uh, the subject of, sort of transsexualism, not like you might get um, American authors like Hubert Selby in Last Exit to Brooklyn, where it's, it's pretty grim. This is, I think, quite a positive affirming uh, take on the subject. And I certainly want to read more Bridget Brophy. Anyway, so what's it about? So the first section is uh, the character who uh, has been orphaned twice, both times parents and foster parents dying in plane crashes. Uh, and yet she finds herself in an airport herself. Um, but she's suffering what she calls linguistic leprosy, where language uh, in five different tongues that she speaks is falling away from her. So there's a lot of sort of meta fictional elements of language and writing and author and fiction um, but she's in the transit lounge having gone through passport control but not yet gone through the gate to, to board the airplane and she decides she's going to stay there she, she you know she she exists in between the two different states of the world outside and and going to a different place on the plane and she says that you know the airport is the only genuine 20th century architect or represents any architecture, sorry, represents the only 20th century architecture that there is. And that, you know, that enhances the appeal. So it's a pretty funny, freewheeling, far ranging opening section. But then we come to section two, where, as she says, there went missing in my own mind, not indeed my sense of my identity, on which I retained a clear, firm clasp throughout the lamentable incident, which I am now going in a manner as straightforward and circumstantial as I can muster to narrate, but a piece of information which, though less individual to me than my identity, was in a certain immediate respects even more vital. And that information is she doesn't know what gender she is, and she's looking for clues to inform her. Um, now, you probably won't remember this, but I do. So on the old British passports, you had like sort of the hard cover and then you had two, um, I mean, cameos or intaglios, I always get them mixed up, but where they sort of cut out from the hard cover. And in that, in written in pen, would be your name. And I can't remember what the other thing was, presumably the passport number. This is how far back we're going, sort of in the 70s. So she thinks, oh, well, the obvious thing is I'll look at my passport and it will say Ms, Ms, Mr, Doctor, whatever. But unfortunately, she spilt coffee on it, so it's smudged because this is how, you know, primitive passport te technology was back in the day. So she can't get the evidence from her own passport, so she looks at her clothes. But her clothes, she suddenly realises, clothes are a ridiculous marker of gender. You know, so she thinks, well, if I go to the toilet, I, you know, the privacy of a, of a booth... I can, you know, undo my clothes and have a look. But then as she walks up to the toilet, she sees the signs for male and female, the pictograms. And, of course, the male is in trousers and the female is in a skirt. And yet she looks around at the airport and all the air stewardesses and all the cleaners who are women, they're all in uniforms. And those are trouser uniforms. So all these obvious markers that we take to help us distinguish gender are shown up by Brophy to be absolutely 
nonsensical. They're not based on any kind of re reality. Um, another thing, you know, so she's she's spotted by someone who knows her, and um, she thinks, well, if I get this guy to buy me a drink, uh, it will also inform, you know, is it a man approaching a woman? Or is it a fellow woman approaching a woman? But even that doesn't work. This is in the 60s when we still had much stricter sort of gender demarcations than we do now in terms of sort of women in the workplace, women in, you know, sort of uh, how they um, enjoy themselves in bars just the same as men, all this sort of stuff. Whereas back in the 60s, you still had saloon bars and women only, you know, bars and things like that. So... It's very funny, and it's. I think it's quite poignant as well. And then we go into a third section where she's sort of crawling through the ducts, the sort of pipes and ducting of of the airport. She comes into the baggage reclaim, things like that, um, and she meets um, a group of radical feminist nuns. And then the final section, there is a sort of a revolution because this is written in the sixties. Don't forget, a time of revolutionary politics. But she's satirising it. It's very funny, I feel. All in all, this is a terrific read. It does go off in several different directions. Sometimes it's a bit hard to keep it all sort of in your mind together. But I really enjoyed this. Five stars. I'm going to read something else by her. And on to Rene Belletto's uh, Dying. So, this is a real curate's egg of a book to try and put into place. There's a translator's note at the beginning of it, which I think is quite significant. It's only short, but I think it helps put it into perspective where... He's talking about Vel a Velasquez painting, um, Velasquez being the uh, court painter of one of the Spanish uh, kings, and that uh, Belletto refers overtly to Velasquez and was very taken with Velasquez. Um, and this painting, normally sort of that era of painting, you expect the king or the Madonna and child in the centre of the painting. Apparently this painting, which I haven't seen, is a void in the centre where sort of everyone is sort of spiralling off the centre, going in different directions, looking in, you know, sort of different perspectives. And that's a bit like this book, because the characters don't stay fixed. You know, are they, you know, are they doppelgangers? Does one morph into another? Are they just, you know, you think it's the, the sort of the voice of the protagonist, and then you find out later that maybe that it's actually a fictional story written in a notebook. Um, by the actual protagonist. So there's a lot of that stuff. It's a book in two parts. The first part sees uh, a guy describing just this sort of horrendous living situation where he's in a sort of uh, a really grimy hostel, he calls it, of rats and... I um, can't remember the other, the other thing. And there's only, only the landlord for company. Uh, and the landlord is always sort of lying, making up these stories about his life to aggrandise himself and always teasing this guy. And in the end, he's had enough, and he decides he's going to break out. So he's going to break into an apartment block to squat, to squat in there. And he does this, and he's just sort of finding himself, finding his bearings in this flat, when the phone goes, and he picks it up, and it's someone for the husband, who lives in, ordinarily lives in this flat, saying that they've kidnapped the guy's wife, and that he's got to take one million francs... Uh, to this venue. Now, he's in possession of two million francs, fortunately, because he miscalculated and actually broke into a flat on the floor above where there were two dead bodies, presumably sort of after a bank robbery, uh, and squabbling over the spoils, they'd killed each other and the money was just lying there. So he's got the money. So he goes to this this place and sees the woman who looks like the woman in the photos in the, in the apartment but it turns out it's not. It's someone who's masquerading as her. And she takes her wig off. And these two start a very intense relationship. But it's always gnawing away at him that this woman has already sort of deceived once because she's you know, playing the role of this woman. Well, she, you know, is the whole uh, kidnapping thing is set up by, by this woman. Uh, but, you know, so that's sort of e eking away at him. And that's the end of the first part. And it ought to be said, if you read this book for the plot, don't. Because the plot is mutable. And as I say, characters morph all over the place. So then we have a sort of uh, uh, inversion of that where the, part one, the man was very unsure, didn't trust the woman. Part two is uh, a guy who has a really intense relationship with a woman called Anita. And he thinks it's slowly sort of sucking and consuming his soul. 
and he has to, but he doesn't want to hurt her. He wants, to, he, he feels that he has to let her down so gently, um, you know, that, that she won't, you know, collapse, as it were. Now, he has told her of his first ever lover who had a, a genetic disease that eventually killed her when she was young and that it was contagious through the saliva, even though it was genetic, it, you know, the saliva could infect you. And this woman, Anita, feels that, you know, she's really troubled by the fact that he's had previous lovers, that sort of jealousy thing. But it manifests itself in by saying, you're going to infect me. I'm going to catch this disease off you. And he goes, I haven't got it. You know, I was very careful with, with this woman. Um, I don't have it. And she keeps pushing and pushing and pushing because it's her anxiety that, that, that he's unfaithful or going to be unfaithful, even though this is, you know, that woman was long before he met Anita. So in the end, he feels he just has to get away from her. So he fakes his own death um, and stages an elaborate charade in a cemetery, you know, which seems to have his grave, all this, this type of thing. So obviously he can't reveal himself to her because he's dead or supposedly dead. And he realises that, you know, their relationship was so intense that they almost never left their room. And he sort of re replicated that by sort of becoming a prisoner. Uh, only he's on his own now. He doesn't even have a relationship. So now he's wondering how he can gradually reveal himself back to her, um, thinking that hopefully this will, you know, reignite and save the relationship when he finds out that she's died. But of course he doesn't know that because he's faked his own death. She could have faked her own death. And on and on this spins with sort of refractions and mirror images and doppelgangers, as I say. I didn't really know what to make of it. Um... Two, two sort of slightly annoying things. When you look at Goodreads, the title Dying is in two sets of, of um, parentheses. And in a way, uh, this edition from Dalkey Press obviously doesn't have that. And I feel it would, it's actually very um, apposite to have, to sort of have those two parentheses. It gives an idea of the sort of mirrors within mirrors uh, sort of structure of this book. And the other thing is, the translator makes out in the original French edition, there were sort of Sabordian photos and images that were false, that, you know, alluded to real people, but actually uh, were not at all. And they're not in this edition either. So I feel slightly cheated that, that these extra um, dimensions to the book are not present in this edition. I gave it four stars, but I was a bit bemused by it overall. And on to a Danielle memoir, public reading followed by discussion. This was wonderful. So an author is scheduled to give a public reading of works in progress, but the author doesn't want to turn up. Also, the author hasn't written anything to read. So we have a, a, um, a stream of readers who stand up in front of the microphone and basically improvise, although there is a trunk on stage which actually does have... Um, work in progress but it's not clear whether it's the readers who've, who've improvised it or the author um so the the crowd who've come to see this author are sort of you know say when's this going to start when's it going to happen and the first reader says okay well now we can do now you can ask questions let's get a discussion going so what this book is is a series of these readers either improvising or responding to uh, the questions that they're being asked. And all the time, uh, in a metafictional way, you're reminded that both the readers and the work of the author and the audience and their questions, this is all scripted by the author. So when someone asks a question uh, and then gets an answer, then the author says... That, you know, that's how it's been written. That's a, a quote from me, the author. Um, and me saying that's a quote from me, the author, is also written by me, the author. So it's sort of endless sort of um, refraction within refraction within refraction. It's very clever. It's, it's quite funny as well. Um, it turns out the author is in the audience, sort of um, in disguise. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just these sort of, sets of questions to texts that don't really exist um and it you know it ends um each of these sort of underpinning of this is fictitious with end of quote 
And I just, you know, I thought it was very clever, very funny. The only thing I will say about it is it's dryly sort of intellectual. I don't mean it's a challenging read in that sense, but it's all ideas and not much emotion and passion about it. So that might put some readers off. But I loved it, five stars. And on to Eric Chivillard, the author of Me, another sort of metafictional work. So this starts off with a guy who sort of pigeonholes a woman in a cafe and starts complaining to her about this, this terrible incident he's just suffered where he ordered his favourite trout uh, amandine dish and instead was served ca uh, cauliflower gratin. And it's so over the top, the nature of his protest. And then in the footnotes, the actual author, who we assume is Chevrolet, or initially we assume is Chevrolet, is going, it's really important to distinguish between the author and his character. And periodically... He goes, yeah, well, that really did happen to me, or a version of that. Whereas, no, no, this is completely out of my imagination. It never happened like this. So there's this sort of dialogue going on between text and, and footnotes as to, you know, what's, what's the reality of this? And the, the, the fictional character complaining about his, his cauliflower gratin, it's so over the top, you think, this guy's protesting too much. And then suddenly you get a... 40-page footnote, or is it 20 But Anyway, a very long footnote where the author starts spinning a tale about something that's happened to him and suddenly you realise that the authority that he carried by the, the footnotes previous to that is completely undermined because this is another ridiculous story which does sort of have tangential intersection with the first one because it in this story it says how, how he came to dislike cauliflower gratin because it was served instead of trout amandine. So he shares that thing with the character that he's created, even though he's sort of been denying it up till now. There's a murder uh, element of it too, but it's, it becomes a ridiculous sort of pilgrimage, uh, mindless pilgrimage, where he keeps gathering characters uh, on this pilgrimage, where they're following an ant because he thinks the police are after him because of this murder. And he feels that the only way to kit out of their clutches is if he has no obviously traceable uh, passage. So he follows an ant as the most sort of um, random sort of direction, almost a situationist, uh, flaneur type thing. And as I say, he gathers these characters. He gathers a young woman who he falls in love with. He gathers an anteater that has escaped from a circus. Uh, and it gets more and more bizarre. And then it comes to a terrible ending which I won't spoil. I mean, when I say terrible, I mean horrific, but in a brilliant way that I just did not see coming. And then we slip back into the earlier mode of this guy still complaining about his cauliflower gratin and the author still sort of pointing out in footnotes. But as I say, by now you feel not only is the character complaining too much, you know, me thinks he doth complain too much, so does the author. And that, that's where I think the genius of this book is. Highly enjoyable, um, I'm going to read one bit. Here it is the character who coincides with the author, not the other way around. The very character who claims to weight himself with authenticity and experience to take on some semblance of life. He robs the author, rifles through his pockets, ransacks his existence. Poor guy, he deserves a break. The author lets him take what he wants, unburdens himself of his excess baggage. He tortures his own barn for the insurance money. Up in flames go the meagre harvest, the emaciated cattle, the broken down combine. He'll rebuild it all where it stood with renewed ambition. He will, he will. So again, it's this, this notion of um, authenticity, that the character on a page has to read as authentic unless they're an unreliable narrator. But even that, they have to be credible, they have to be believable to the reader. Um, so he's saying in order to do that, the author must put parts of himself in there, even though he's heavily disguising it. Literature is intimately bound up with humiliation. Those on whom life smiles, with its slightly empty-headed smile, waste no time with books, neither writing nor reading them. This, at least, is an undeniable fact, confirmed all round us every day. Like every law, it allows a number of exceptions, among which the author hopes to include his reader. Nevertheless, on the whole, it holds absolutely true. The audience at public readings is made up mostly of bored middle-aged ladies. Those women are highly respectable and graced with as many human qualities as the sharp elbow, downy-cheeked nymphette or the devoted father, but they have time to kill. 
a time not filled with the occupations of existence exciting enough to satisfy them. When the reader happens to be a young man, you can be sure that his psychological profile presents certain doleful peculiarities. That boy has no friends. His aggrieved, endless virginity torments his clenched body from the tips of his hair to the yellow nails digging painfully into his big toe. He has no sense of style, he moves without grace or agility, his gestures and walk are self-conscious, his words sparse or hurried, and most often profoundly confused. His bookish learning, unreal and disordered, creates an unwholesome monster, ill-adapted, antisocial, possibly perverse. Writers are no more appealing a sight. Is it by chance that Michel Hoelbeck has become a hero of our literary microcosm? His visible, flagrant, triumphant wretchedness is a symptom of a lamentable state of affairs, to which a thousand other signs bear witness. No misunderstanding is possible. The victor had to be a victim. Literature is a misery. The author sometimes catches himself yawning in boredom as he stands at his bookshelf. Suddenly he can't imagine what book he might implore for his rescue. At such times he can't help thinking that writers are snakes, that humanity nurtures in its breast, that their only gift is to make our plight even more painful by deepening our awareness of it, by describing it so clearly that we're robbed of all life-saving illusion, all restful insouciance, that a tragic lucidity ruins our happiest hours that time runs through us like a blade. So those are the footnotes from, from the author character in this. And as you can see, in a way, these two books are sort of linked. And on to Jenny Erpenbeck's Kairos. So Jenny Erpenbeck can really write a sentence. Um, and the first 94 pages of this, if a bit of a hackneyed subject of a younger woman falls for an older man who's married, they have an affair, there are enough good lines in it to sort of make it, make you want to carry on reading, I guess. How original is it? Well, the subject isn't original. Can you genuinely make it original just through language? It's hard. And then suddenly on page 95, he uh, ties her up uh, to the bed in a bondage situation, which he's not entirely comfortable with. And... You have two responses to that. One is, well, this has come out of nowhere because it's not really been signposted that that's within him. And second of all, it's like, oh, so is this going to be an abusive relationship from now on? Bondage isn't inherently abusive, but her consent is, is not offered. He's not doing it against her will, but equally he's not doing it with her will. So you think, OK, well, this is where the book's going to go now, but it sort of doesn't. Then we get a long sort of interminable section where... They're together, they're apart. She's doing a one-year course in stage design in another city. She has a one-night stand, he finds out. And then he decides to he's going to punish her for, you know, in their relationship forevermore. And he sort of records these tapes asking questions that she has to answer, and which is a very bizarre um, sort of dynamic. And then towards the end of the book, maybe the last fifth, sixth, we get the decline of East Germany as the wall comes down, how it disappears, you know, the state of East Germany disappears, which was interesting from a factual point of view, just remembering from that time in 1988, 89, from what's that, 30-odd years ago. I mean, I do remember it happening. So from an informative or jogging my recollection, it was interesting. But if it seems to be some sort of metaphor for their relation, the decay of their relationship, it just didn't work at all because you had all this other stuff you know, which to the detriment, and suddenly you talk about in much more sort of symbolic language. So, this book did not work at all for me on any level, despite a relatively well written start. And I just think I'm done with Jenny Erpenbeck. This is about the fifth or sixth of her books, and I really like her first two books, uh, The Older Child, and I can't remember what the other one was called. But I've had diminishing returns ever since. I think I gave this two stars or maybe three but it's sort of 2.5 stars in case i didn't mention um the chevrolet was five stars and finally to a pastoral by lee thompson so full disclosure uh lee is an author on corona zanazat the publishers who publish my current book um the death of the author in triplicate uh, so it's on. It's you know my publishers. This book is on, and Lee asked me if I would review it. So he sent me a copy. So this, you know, has been sent to me by the author. 
uh, he didn't you know, request any particular, you know, didn't he like every author I've dealt with who sent me a book for review, none of them has ever sort of said for a good review. So this is purely my reaction to it. And um, what a jolly jape read it was. So in a state which I assume to be Canada, the president has brought in a new law, terrible, terrifying law, because the state is fed up with the cost of long term prisoners, of repeat offenders, of psychopaths for who there is no treatment. And that, that policy is that they take the minds of the, uh, of the criminals and they put them into domestic and farmyard animals. So you don't have to have an expensive prison for these guys, you just have a farmyard stockade with a, with a fence. Um, and animals tend not to live as long as man and all, all this sort of stuff. So this is a terrifying world we're plunged into. Echoes of Animal Farm, but for me Animal Farm doesn't have a lot of humour. This is pretty funny. And what I liked about it so much is, I think it very skillfully, you have these sort of um, plot lines in parallel. One is uh, the protagonist as an animal, he's a sheep, sort of reacting and learning the world anew with his sheep's body, with his sheep's sensate senses. You know, so he still has a human brain, but there's lots of stuff he has to adjust to, such as his diet, you know, what he can eat as a sheep, um, how he how he voids as a sheep, how he moves as a four-legged sheep, all these sorts of things he's having to learn for the first time using a human brain. So you've got that sort of storyline. Then you also have, in flashback, in, but it told in parallel, the heist. Um, it was a diamond heist. I think it was a diamond heist. Um, on, a, on a jewellers with him and three other guys and how, you know, they were pretty inept and how it was sort of doomed from the beginning and how he ended up as the one getting this treatment while the other guys went to a much softer sentence because they, you know, allegedly he was responsible for the, the murder of, of the jewel store owner who did die but by an improbable sort of accident. Um, so you get that in parallel and that's also very funny. And then you get slightly sort of further advanced um, when he basically wants to break out of prison and what that entails. So you get these three storylines in parallel and they really play off each other really well I feel. And I think the only time the book dropped off is when the heist section had been completed. We'd, we'd been told from A to Z of that and it was no longer in the narrative so we just had this sort of um, duality of him as a sheep uh, making his break for freedom, uh, with him as a sheep first undergoing the operation, revi you know, being re revived after the operation, and, and how, as I say, he sort of learns to grasp his new physical life. But, you know, this is very funny, it's obviously satirical, um, but, you know, really enjoyable. I gave this five stars. And there you have it. Uh, till next time, thanks very much.